Mary stumbled her way home well past two in the morning on Saturday. Her Friday evening had kicked off right after work, as she and a few friends decided to kickstart the weekend at their favorite bar. They indulged in more than a few drinks and danced the night away until the combination became overwhelming for Mary. Grateful that she hadn't driven, she knew Darren would've been her designated driver yet again, subjecting her to his lectures all the way home. Being out late had become a common occurrence for her over the past year or so. As she made her way down the dark hallway, barely able to put one foot in front of the other, Mary contemplated her husband's probable sleeping state. It wouldn't be beneath her to make enough noise to rouse him from his slumber, in fact, she relished the idea. With a drunken smirk still adorning her face, she acknowledged her growing bitterness. Ascending the stairs, she bypassed the guest room without a glance and continued her unsteady journey. By the time she reached the master bedroom, she was using the wall for support. Pushing the door open with her foot, she was surprised to find the bedside lamp illuminated, and even more surprised to discover the bed empty. Where the hell is he? Her mind demanded, prompting her legs to move towards the bathroom instinctively. After a thorough search of the upstairs yielded no sign of him, she descended the stairs, her heart pounding. A faint glow emanated from the kitchen, leading her to believe he might have drifted off at the table while waiting for her. No such luck awaited her. Instead, she found the hood light above the stove left on, further fueling her frustration. He's going to catch an earful when he finally shows up, she muttered angrily. As she scanned the clutter on the counter, she debated leaving it for the morning, but a glint of something shiny caught her eye. Driving a high top chair closer, she slumped into it and examined the object she had picked up, Darren's wedding ring. The weight of it in her hand only intensified her growing unease. Beneath it lay a jumble of documents, her passport, what appeared to be a ticket of some sort, and a sealed envelope. Glancing at the time on her watch, 2.30, she contemplated waiting for Darren to return and provide some explanation. With a heavy sigh, she rested her head on her folded arms and succumbed to sleep within moments, the mystery of Darren's absence still looming over her. Mary couldn't recall how she ended up on the floor, but the impact jolted her awake despite her intoxicated state. Rubbing her face groggily, she glanced at her watch, 5.45. Anger surged within her as she realized Darren had returned home and left her slumbering on the counter. Determined to confront him, she stormed up the stairs, but once again found the bedroom empty upon arrival. This time she moved with purpose, swiftly descending the stairs and flipping on the overhead light in the kitchen, flooding the room with brightness. Confusion mingled with frustration as she swung open the door to the garage, only to find Darren's car still absent. Her gaze returned to the counter, where the pile of items remained untouched. Examining her passport, she noted the outdated photo, realizing she hadn't used it in years. The airline ticket to Florida puzzled her further, and her curiosity peaked as she tore open the envelope bearing her name. Racing to retrieve her reading glasses from the night table, she returned to the kitchen, clutching the letter in hand, and settled onto a stool at the counter to unravel the mystery before her. Dear Mary, if you're reading this, you've undoubtedly discovered that I'm not at home and you've come across everything I've left behind for you. You've probably heard it in bars, especially over the past couple of years. About 30 minutes before closing time, they'll announce last call. Well, my dear wife, consider this your last call. I'm sure you won't be shocked to hear me say that our marriage hasn't been working for quite some time. I wish I could say I'm willing to let it limp along as it has been for the past few years, but that's not in the cards. As I see it, we have two options. Option 1. You can muster the courage to gather up those documents and join me for a tough week of trying to salvage what's left of our relationship. If you choose this path, I'll be there to meet you when you arrive, and we can take it from there. Option 2 isn't as pleasant. We part ways, divide everything equally, and put an end to what has sadly become a charade of a marriage. I can't say I wouldn't prefer option two, but because there's still some semblance of feeling left, albeit not much, I'm willing to give it one last shot. I won't delve into a lengthy analysis of how we reached this point or whose fault it may be. I'll simply say that I can't continue down the path you've chosen for us. Mary paused in her reading, glancing around the room with disbelief. 
Surely, this had to be some sort of joke. Darren wouldn't have the nerve to follow through with what he had penned. Any moment now, she expected him to walk through the door, sheepishly seeking forgiveness, as he always did. This is the gratitude I receive for being lenient with him, Mary mused bitterly. If he believes he can intimidate me with the threat of divorce, he's sorely mistaken. Despite her irritation, she resolved to continue reading his foolish letter, reasoning that she had already invested this much time into it. Mary, we shared many wonderful moments in the past and have raised two incredible children together. However, as the saying goes, staying in a troubled marriage just for the sake of the children isn't sustainable. Our kids are grown now, forging their own paths with the people they've chosen. I believe that if we're both willing to make some compromises, we can rediscover the love and connection we had when we first met. It won't be simple, but it's essential if we want our marriage to endure. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! She muttered, flinging the letter onto the counter. I gave that man everything I had, and now he has the audacity to say it's not enough. I swear on my life, he'll pay for this when he walks through that door, Mary declared to the empty room. If he had even an ounce of backbone instead of being a spineless coward, maybe I wouldn't have to constantly push him. If it weren't for me, he'd still be stuck as a lowly rub salesman instead of climbing the corporate ladder like he has. He should be groveling at my feet instead of issuing ultimatums. Who does he think he is? And who does he think he's talking to? His damn mother. Mary's agitation grew, as it often did when Darren failed to meet her expectations. With a huff, she returned to reading the letter. As mentioned, Mary, I'll be there to meet you at the plane, ready to embark on the journey of rebuilding our lives together. However, it's crucial that you ensure you're on that plane. Mary glanced at the ticket in disbelief. There's no way I can catch that flight. It leaves in just three hours, she exclaimed, checking her watch. Mr. High and Mighty will be in for a surprise when I'm not on that plane, she muttered, twirling his wedding ring on the counter. And as for this ring, he won't be getting it back so easily. He'll have to earn it, she smirked, envisioning the tasks she'd make him undertake. When the ring slipped from her fingers and clattered to the floor, she simply left it there, feeling drained. After a night of revelry with her friends, all she craved was sleep. Dealing with her husband could wait until she was ready. Unaware of the consequences outlined in the letter, Mary didn't bother to read further. If she had, she would have seen a series of events already set in motion, beginning in just a few short hours. Later that morning, nursing a cup of coffee at the kitchen table and swearing off alcohol, Mary was startled by the arrival of Darren's two brothers, Frank and James, who entered through the front door. Excuse me, but you two can't just barge into my house, even if you are Darren's brothers, Mary snapped, eyeing Frank and James as they entered. Take your time finishing your coffee. We're just here to collect a few things my brother asked us to grab, Frank retorted, shooting a disdainful glance at his sister-in-law. Fine, go ahead. And make sure to inform him that he's in for a world of trouble when he gets back, Mary shot back sharply. They didn't bother responding, simply dashing upstairs with a box of black trash bags. Three quick trips later, they were gone, not uttering another word to Mary. They could have at least said thank you. Mary grumbled to herself, draining her second cup of coffee and contemplating whether to have breakfast or lunch, glancing up at the clock. After a late lunch, she went shopping with her friends, and since Darren wasn't around, they ended up making a night of it again. But she never made it home. She awoke on Kelly's couch Sunday afternoon, praying for relief from her pounding headache. For the second time in two days, she swore off alcohol, though she knew it would only last until she sobered up and felt better. Darren's probably at home right now, wondering where the hell I am. Let him stew in his own worry, she thought, before drifting back to sleep. Despite her initial spiteful intentions, Mary realized she couldn't stay over at Kelly's on Sunday night. The looming Monday morning work schedule and the lack of spare clothes at her friend's place compelled her to return home. As she stepped into the still empty house, Mary's anger resurfaced. He can try to avoid me all he wants, but he can't escape forever, she muttered to herself, already plotting her next moves for when she finally confronted Darren. Sunday night passed quietly, too quietly for Mary's liking. As she lay in bed reading, her thoughts unexpectedly drifted towards Darren, 
albeit not in a hostile manner for once. Maybe I'll cut him some slack when he returns. It's been a while, and I know how much he enjoys pleasuring me, she pondered, feeling a stir deep within her, not love per se, but a sensation akin to the satisfaction she felt after Darren had brought her to climax. She awoke late on Monday morning, her book still resting on her lap. Monday morning was chaotic. Without Darren's usual prodding, Mary found herself running late for work, arriving half an hour behind schedule. The day passed in its usual flurry of activity, and it wasn't until Kelly inquired about Darren's tardiness that Mary's attention was drawn to his absence. At 10.54, Mary was approached by a man in a suit who handed her an envelope without a word. Mrs. Mary Gray, you've been served, he stated simply before turning on his heel and exiting the premises. He's crossed a line, Mary seethed internally. That little jerk is going to pay dearly for humiliating me like this, she raged, scanning her surroundings to gauge who might have witnessed the encounter. During lunch, Kelly and Mary perused the contents of the envelope. He's not asking for much, Kelly remarked, flipping through the five-page document. Fifty percent of the savings, his four hundred and one, and you get to keep the house. It seems like he just wants out. He's not getting a damn thing, Mary declared venomously, unleashing the bitterness usually reserved for Darren. By the time I'm finished with him, he'll regret ever crossing me. During lunch, Mary logged into their online bank accounts and was shocked to discover that 50% of their funds had been withdrawn. When she contacted the bank, they informed her that Darren had made the withdrawal, and they had no record of any additional accounts in his name. It was clear to Mary that he had taken the money and opened a new account elsewhere. On her way home from work, Mary stopped by another bank and opened a new account in her name only. Two can play this game, she thought, determined to protect herself. Arriving at her empty house, Mary poured herself a generous glass of wine and made her way to the kitchen. There, she retrieved Darren's letter and the other items left on the counter two days prior. With renewed interest, she reread the letter from where she had left off. Mary, if you choose not to board that flight, then I'll take it as my answer, and the following steps will be set in motion. I've already taken what belongings I wanted from the house, leaving aside only the remainder of my clothes. My brothers will arrive sometime on Saturday to retrieve whatever else remains. On Monday, you'll be served with the divorce papers I had prepared months ago. As I mentioned, this is your final opportunity, and if you're not with me by Saturday, then it's the end. I'll strive to be fair, but if you decide to contest it, things could turn ugly, and I'm sure neither of us wants that. Regarding our children, they've been aware for some time that our marriage has existed in name only, so they shouldn't be too shocked. As for our families, well, they're likely surprised we've lasted this long. That's all I have to say until we meet face to face or not. If not, I genuinely wish you a good life, and despite everything, I harbor no ill will towards you. My hope is that you find whatever brings you happiness. Your husband, Darren. Mary's initial reaction to the airline ticket and accompanying documents was a resounding shit. On Sunday morning, thousands of miles away, Darren lounged in a chair, engrossed in the new gadget he had purchased the previous week. I'm sorry, Peggy said, glancing at Darren. Don't be. It's mostly my fault. If I hadn't given in to her all these years and stood my ground, maybe we wouldn't be in this mess now. That again, who knows? At this point, I don't even care. I'm just relieved it's finally over, Darren replied, scrolling through the iPad menu in search of the books he had downloaded earlier. Did you really think she would come? Peggy inquired. No, but I promised my kids I'd give it one last shot, Darren admitted, his attention still fixed on the screen. You're just happy we won't be needing both cabins anymore. Well, if you want, we can alternate cabins every night. That way we'll always have a fresh bed to mess up, Peggy teased, pulling Darren close and planting a kiss on him, tinged with more than a hint of passion. Peggy had worked alongside Darren for the past decade, witnessing his gradual decline in happiness within his marriage. Her own husband had passed away eight years prior, and Darren had become a source of comfort for her during her moments of frustration. He had been a supportive friend, offering reassurance that things would improve with time and extending an open ear whenever she needed to vent. He had become her confident and sounding board. 
Yet, Darren wasn't always gentle and agreeable. There were times when he had to give her a reality check. Your husband may have passed away, but you're still alive. Randy wouldn't have wanted you to give up on life. Grieve for him, yes, but then move forward. You're young, attractive, and have a lot to offer. Any man would be lucky to have you, he had told her once. It felt like a lifetime ago. The card she had given him three years ago had only two words on it, thank you. It was left unsigned on his desk, but Darren knew exactly who it was from. Two years ago, their roles were first. Peggy started listening to Darren's troubles and offering her advice when asked. There was never anything physical between them, although Peggy knew she would have jumped at the chance. They became close friends who relied more and more on each other. Nine months ago, Darren came into work on Monday fuming with anger. It was all about Mary, her complaints, her ingratitude, and he was done with her. Still, Peggy stood by, offering advice, but Mary's behavior crossed a line. It got so bad that Peggy was ready to take drastic action to ease Darren's suffering. Then, out of nowhere, Darren made an unexpected offer, a one-week paid vacation on the Carnival Glory. However, there was a catch. They'd have separate cabins. Peggy was puzzled. This cruise is my last attempt to salvage whatever's left of my marriage, although I'm almost certain Mary will let it slip through her fingers like everything else. Darren confessed to Peggy. Even if she decides to join me, I want you there on the ship in the other cabin to help me come to terms with the fact that it's over. Peggy smiled, expressing her eagerness to accompany him, and they made the arrangements together. At Southwest Airline Gate number 26, they waited together. When the pilot and crew finally disembarked, Darren felt a wave of relief. Without a second thought, he grabbed a shocked Peggy and kissed her, first lightly and then with a passion he had harbored for years. I've wanted to do that for years, he admitted, stealing another kiss before declaring they had a boat to catch. After checking into their respective rooms, they sat on deck, marveling at the offerings of the next seven glorious days. Darren switched Peggy's dinner table reservation, and they opted out of booking any excursions. Maybe on our next cruise, Peggy suggested with a smile. They spent the day exploring the ship, enjoying a delightful dinner, and dancing the night away at the clubs. As it approached 1 a.m., they reluctantly addressed the sleeping arrangements. For the first night, they slept separately in their own cabins. This is the last time I'll ever sleep alone, Darren declared to Peggy over breakfast. As he slid a promise ring onto her finger, he vowed to take it one day at a time until the divorce was finalized. Peggy felt like she was walking on air, her head in the clouds. When they finally spent the night together on Sunday, it exceeded all of Darren's expectations. He felt genuinely happy again. On the final day of the cruise, Peggy suggested they hide away in their cabin and relive the moments they had shared. Darren loved the idea, but reality beckoned. Two people are expected back at work on Monday, and I doubt our bosses would understand, he reasoned. Peggy considered asking anyway, but Darren suggested another plan. Why don't you let me move in with you? She proposed. Although tempted, Darren decided to reside, at least for the time being, with his brother Frank while the divorce proceedings unfolded. Despite Mary's barrage of insults and threats, Darren remained unfazed, wearing his happiness like armor. The divorce was granted, and the 90-day waiting period until it became official commenced. Their children grew weary of their mother's constant tirades, suggesting that if she had treated Darren like a loving husband instead of a doormat, they might still be married. Mary's response was to cut off communication with both of them for a month. With just 10 days left before their divorce was finalized, Mary spotted the engagement announcement in the newspaper and promptly fired off a scathing email to Darren. The day after his divorce was official, Darren and Peggy exchanged vows in an intimate ceremony, attended by a select few, including his children, parents, Peggy's sister, and her parents. Darren found himself growing happier with each passing day. A month later, Mary found herself sitting alone in the bar with what remained of her friends. Around 1.30 in the morning, the bartender rang the bell signaling last call. If only, Mary muttered to herself, a hint of sadness creeping into her voice. If only. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.